Hello, I'm Bernard Tatunji, and with my wife Jane, now five children, I'm a member of the Shunset family branch in Sydney. As has been discussed in the earlier Covenant Sunday presentations, our national Shunset theme for 2024 is Walking Together Loving the Church. The impetus for this has come from the recently held Australian Plenary Council and its six themes for discernment. One of those themes asks how God is calling us to be a church that's humble, healing and merciful. The question then for us is what does the spirituality of our movement and the writings of Father Kentenich offer to us in this regard? How does Schoenstatt assist us to walk together loving the church and to offer a church that's humble, healing and merciful? What can Schoenstatt offer to the wider church and indeed the wider world around humility, healing and mercy? Certainly since the Second Vatican Council, this topic of a humble church has become more broadly discussed. The fathers of the council spoke of the pilgrim church to emphasize that the church was not a static entity to be reverentially looked upon, but truly walking with her children in all their difficulties towards their heavenly home. And in more recent times, if one's to speak about the church, the terribly dark chapter of abuse comes to the fore and the calls are for the church to apologize for what went wrong and to offer healing to victims and their families. Lastly, the topic of mercy has been one that's also had renewal under the pontificate of Pope Francis with his vision of the church as a field hospital, working on the margins and accompanying people in their difficulties. To be humble, healing and merciful really are the words of our time, so it's little wonder that the plenary picked them up as, the six, as one of its six themes. I think that if we as members of this movement are to be able to support the church in the way that our father and founder envisaged, then we are challenged around what we can offer to the church when we consider this theme. The answer that I want to present for your consideration is that we as Schoenstatt members should be offering to the church and the world the same gift that Christ offered from the cross, and that is the gift of his mother. If the church is truly to become a vessel of healing, humility and mercy, then it must be ever more a Marian church. This will be nothing new to movement members watching this, but I think that reaffirming the need for a Marian church solves so many of the problems we see in the church and in the world today. Mary stands as the true gateway to the Trinity. She's the daughter of the Father, the mother of the Son, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She's the new Eve who's crushed the head of the serpent. She shines forth as the model of all the virtues, truly one of us, but spared from all sin. There's no one who cannot benefit from knowing and loving her. As her litany reminds us, she's mother of mercy, health of the sick, refuge of sinners, and comfort of the afflicted. In her own song of praise of Magnificat, Mary knows that it's her humility that's caused God's favour to come upon her. No one embodies healing, humility, and mercy better than Mary. On the 8th of December 1965, on the day the Second Vatican Council came to a solemn close, Father Kentonick gave an address in Rome, erecting a wayside shrine on a new property that had been purchased for an eventual shrine that would be named Mother of the Church. In this address, Father speaks on the mission of the Church and, of course, the mission of Schoenstatt family in a post-conciliar church. He makes some remarks that can assist us in considering both the Church and Mary's place in it. In the beginning, Father asks what he calls the great question, and that is, how does the church see herself today? He gave three answers, but I'm most interested in the last. He said that first, the church was at the same time tied to tradition, yet free from tradition. Second, the church unites her children while governing them. And lastly, he said the church has a mission to be, quote, the soul of the culture and of the world. And this I see has a real connection to the premise that we must be an offer to the world a Marian church. We know that Christianity has had differing levels of connection with the surrounding culture. From the beginning, preachers, teachers and evangelists have taken the gospel to those who did not know it. And in many of those cases, the faith not only took root, but over time shaped whole cultures. Consider Europe. Today, there is a deliberate push to exclude Christianity. But that continent is only what it is because of the way the faith formed, shaped and enriched its relations to itself and the world. We could look at the way that Christianity is today influencing Asia and Africa, creating new and vibrant movements of faith. In this vein, Father Kentonick makes clear his belief that, quote, there should be no separation between the church and culture, nor between the church and the world, 
No, the church should be the source, the soul of culture in its totality. This is obviously a far cry from nations like Australia, where the public link between faith and culture and church and state is pushed away. In many places, there's a vehement hatred of Christianity and a rejection of the influence that it might have. The call, made mostly by an agenda-driven left elite, for a neutral society, free from the perceived backwardness and even danger of faith, more specifically, Christianity. The error made is that there's no such thing as a neutral society. If we are not upheld by faith, we'll create new gods which must be blessed and venerated. Some of those gods in the Western world today include the gods of sexual anarchy, gender confusion, climate alarmism, and absolute freedom tied to no moral code. I think at this very moment of the push in New South Wales to drive through so-called anti-conversion laws, meaning that no one, priest, parent, friend, will be permitted to do anything to offer another way to a person who's going through gender confusion. This is a direct attack on Christ and the Christian moral code because the state's stepping over the traditional role of the church, which as we know calls all people, no matter what their particular proclivity to sin, to an ever greater conversion in all aspects of life. Yet again, we see one of our words, conversion, which is a beautiful movement of the soul towards God, being taken over by an anti-Christian agenda and used against us. Christianity and faithful Christians will more and more find themselves persecuted in the public square and private life unless Christians can humbly offer healing and mercy to a world that's been broken and debased. Returning to the text of Father Kentenich, he moves on to consider Mary as mother of the church, and he does so because he's paralleling with the fact that on that day in 1965, along with the closing of Vatican II, Pope Paul VI was also blessing a new church dedicated to the mother of the church. Father Kentenich, being the man of providence that he is, does not miss the opportunity to link what he deems to the providential actions taking place that day between the council, the new church receiving the Pope's blessing, and the blessing of the wayside shrine in Rome. Father's question is what is Mary's function as a mother for the church? He does go on to stress that she's both mother in the fullest sense and also model. The council fathers had much debated her place and they had actually not led the discussion towards what some deemed to be excessive devotion to Mary, but rather they wanted to position Mary very much as mother and true model of Christians. Father Kentonick said in his address that Mary, quote, is not only the model of this church, but also a mother who has the power to conceive and give birth to this church, end quote. We need to be clear that Mary is not just a member of the church in the same way you and I are members of the church. She could not be separated from it any more than we could say that a mother is no longer the mother of a child she's birthed. So I think when we talk, we must move our minds to how we walk with the church and present the church as healing. And it's not possible to do this without Mary. That gift of Christ to St. John from the cross was the gift of his mother. But not just a mother for St. John or a mother for us, but the mother of his church. Really, he offers her as mother to the world because we know that in Christ, all people are offered a covenant status in the church through baptism. The door is open to everyone. While popularity to make Pentecost, while popular Pentecost is the birth of the church, we're not wrong to think about Good Friday as the birth of the church. St. John Chrysostom said water and blood symbolize baptism in the Holy Eucharist, and from these two sacraments, the church is born. From the cross, Christ gave himself for all of us, and he made sure there'd be no doubt as to Mary's role. Father Kentonick also said in his presentation that it was at the cross that Mary repeated her yes and proved herself a mother when she cooperated in making the birth of the church a reality. So we now have the church with Christ as the head, and Mary as the mother, they can never be separated. The church, we must then remind ourselves, is not ours to craft in our image. In fact, consider the language. We are baptized into the church, we enter into the church. We cannot take what we like and ignore what we don't. And I don't just mean what we might call hard teachings, but I also mean Mary. When we go into our networks and want to offer a church that's humble, merciful and full of healing, what more can we offer than the mother of the Lord? How the church and the world would change if the Blessed Mother was known and loved as a mother of us all. Very often we fill ourselves with verses and teachings and laws when we want to offer to someone the church. What if we were just to offer them Mary, to point them to their mother and allow mother and child to come to know one another in a unity of hearts? As Schoenstatt members, more than anybody else in the church, we ought to be her loudest advocates because we've entered covenant with her. And the great gift we have received is we have not only a concept or a past vision of Mary, 
No, we have offered her a dwelling place and she's made her throne in the shrine. How do we offer the healing that people are searching for? Bring them to the shrine. The shrine is such a gift because it's a dwelling among us, like the Lord at the Transfiguration. The shrine's our mount table, where we don't just gaze on him who's transfigured, but we stand on our mountain, on Mount Shunstat. And we're in the presence of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, who are always united with our Mother Thrice Admirable. We know that in the shrine, Mary intercedes the grace of transformation. It's one of the three graces of the shrine. She'll work to transform anyone who's open enough to seek it. We can ask ourselves, how many people have we brought to the shrine in the past? How many do we need to bring to the shrine this year? Who has the Lord put in our path that is looking for healing? Who is looking for mercy? And of course, what we offer does not end with the physical daughter shrines. Father Kentenick reminded us in one of his talks when he was in exile in Milwaukee that beyond the original shrine, the national shrine and the home shrines, we can add even a fourth shrine, that's ourselves. He asked though, what's it mean? I must become a shrine. That's why I go to the national shrine, to become a shrine myself, Father said. The point is, yes, we can bring people to the shrine, but we can also bring Mary to them in their home and in their heart. How easy the Blessed Mother's made it for us. Can you see in that the importance of the Pilgrim Mother Apostolate? Incidentally, next year will be 75 years since Shunstadt member, servant of God, John Posabon, swung a large MT over his shoulder and began carrying it across Brazil. Over 35 years, he walked almost 140,000 kilometers to bring the Blessed Mother and her son to families, homes, parishes, schools, and prisons. And that's someone who really believed in the transformative power of the shrine. It's an example for all of us. I do want to return to what Father Kentinick said about the church being the soul of the culture and of the world. I think as Christians, it can seem easier to retreat from the world in all its hedonistic chaos. I know that's certainly what I've tended to do more recently. I mentioned my wife and I have five children, their age from 10 to two, and I know that our time to guide and impress upon them a love for the Lord and the faith is short, and I know that the evils of secularism and hedonism will be ready to greet them when they venture into the world as adults, much like the serpent in the garden. So I just prefer to circle the wagons, protect my corner, and let the world cannibalize itself. I see a lesson for myself in this theme then. Yes, I have a responsibility to protect the innocence and faith of my family, but to those who of us have been given much, much will be expected. And you and I have been given much in Shunset, and we can't just leave the public square and retreat into our home shrines because the world claims to want no part of God. We must offer a new soul to the culture. We must take them to the new shore. And only the church offers the hope, healing and mercy that this secular age needs. And maybe, just maybe, God in his infinite wisdom knew that it would be easier for sinful mankind to have recourse to him through a loving, humble and merciful mother than through what people might incorrectly perceive to be an angry and vengeful God. So, far from apologising for the church and her message, we need to speak all the louder about the church and that the Blessed Mother is the mother of all of us, whether a person knows it or not. The more that you and I become clearer images of Mary, the more you and I expand our heart shrine and use our home shrine, invite people to encounter transformation in our national shrines, the more quickly will our world feel, find the humble, healing and merciful church that it's searching for. Thank you. And our questions for discussion. One, how do you most see the world needing hope, healing and mercy today? Two, in what ways have you found yourself trying to remedy brokenness amongst family, friends, or those within your circle of influence? Three, what do you think about bringing Mary to those places and people in need of hope and healing? And four, how do you see you could utilize the shrine, be it daughter shrine, home shrine, heart shrine, or pilgrim mother shrine, to bring Mary in transformation to those in need? Thank you.